Welcome everyone to this uh, clinical uh, midline session organized by Vida. I just want to know if you will hear me well. Could you write it in the chat to be sure that you hear well? Okay, perfect. Um, so welcome, welcome everyone. And thank you so much for being with us today um, in this webinar. Uh, we have people from many parts of the world, and I'm really, really glad to welcome you all. We have reached today more than 360 registrations over 43 countries. That's amazing. Uh, just to have a look, we have people from Algeria, Belgium, Brazil, Colombia, uh, Czech Republic, Denmark, uh, many people from Spain, uh, Finland, my dear Oscar, we have people from Finland, France, uh, Germany, Greece, uh, Hong Kong, India, a lot of Indian uh, doctors, uh, Ireland, Israel, Italy, Kenya, a uh, lot of Kenyan doctors as well, welcome all, uh, and some people from Asia, Malaysia, uh, Netherlands, uh, Norway, Poland, Qatar, Russia, Singapore, South Africa, uh, Thailand, Sweden, United Arab, etc. A lot, a lot of people. So thank you very much uh, for being there. Uh, so 360 registration, 43 countries, and in, it includes uh, more than 250 people from the medical field. We have nurses, uh, anesthetists, uh, chief nurse, teachers, anesthesiologists, doctors, uh, interventional radiologists, surgeon, pediatrician, uh, intensive care specialists, a lot of people again, and more than 100 people from the medical industry. So even if we hope to see you uh, all soon, I mean, for real, uh, in the field for real demo, uh, definitely this kind of digital training is for now the best way to bring together so many people around the world. And gathering such people from the medical field is a real honor and a great way, a great way uh, to share learning and experiences uh, over the world without border. So thanks, thanks, thanks you all. Let me introduce uh, who main speaker today. I'm really glad to welcome Mr. Mr. Oscar Nihal. Uh, he is a practical nurse uh, since 1994. He worked in different worlds like uh, geriatric unit, surgical services, as a scrub nurse like ENT, orthopedic, trauma, urology, thorax, and vascular surgery. In, 20, uh, in 2003, he started working as an OR anesthesia nurse in NCT University Hospital and became in 2008 outpatient anesthesia unit coordinator. Then he became in 2015 vascular access nurse, vascular access team leader two years after, and main instructor in vascular access team in 2018. He participated in the development of several publications in 2017, in Vokova posters uh, 2018 and 2020, and all on vascular access field. So I think he's a real expert. And last but not least, uh, he speaks uh, four languages, Swedish, Finnish, uh, English, and a bit of German, but he will not talk um, German today. From my side, I'm Maxim, and I'm in charge of development of vascular access device for Vigan, for Vigan. I'm a registered nurse as well. I have worked uh, 13 years as a nurse in France and abroad in Asia, in different worlds like uh, ER, uh, ICU, resource room, home care, uh, surgery service, and for the French National Health Service in a helicopter medical team unit. Here are for the main speaker. And now, uh, here is the agenda for today. Uh, so here the agenda, but for the next hour. So in the first step, Oscar will talk about the vascular access team in his hospital in Helsinki. Then we will see the indication and contraindication and the advantages of the midline catheters. We will talk shortly about the insertion procedure, the clinical tip and tricks from our expert, Oscar. And in the end, we're gonna have a Q&A uh, session. About this Q&A, uh, you, uh, you can see the chat on the down right side of your screen. So please 
feel free to ask your questions at any moment of the session and we will reply to you at the end of the session during this Q&A. And remember, last thing, um, at the end of this webinar, you will receive a personal certificate of attendance and the link to access the replay, which will be available around two weeks only. So think about saving, uh, saving it on your computer. For the one who cannot attend this, uh, this webinar, they will receive as well um, the link for the replay if they have registered. To, to conclude this introduction, I just wanted to have a short talk about the device we're going to talk today. Uh, we're going to talk about the smart midline, but what is uh, the smart midline exactly? Just a really short uh, topic about this. Um, so, is it a midline? But it's also what we can call an extended dual catheter. Because you know from the literature, we used to say that the extended dual catheter is like a short midline or midi midline. It's from 4 to 15 centimeters. So, this catheter can be an extended dual catheter because according to this uh, the length, we have many lengths available from four to 25 centimeters. So it can be a dextedual dual catheter, EDC, and it can be a midline or a mid-clavicular uh, line because you have 15 to 25 centimeters long. We have a profile automatic tip from two to five French. Uh, why I put different color? Because the two and three French, is it this one, uh, the, 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 the white one, and the four and five French are the one in the picture with the with the green uh, wings. This catheter is pressure tested. It can be it can be um, CT scan can be done with this catheter, and we're gonna see uh, we're gonna prove that with Oscar. We wanna talk about this. Uh, we have an integrated extension line, and this kind of catheter are single lumen. Two way to insert through smart midline. For the two, three, and four French, we have the direct Seldinger technique. You can use um, a dilator, including in the back, just in case, but some people don't need it. And for the five French, you can use the modified Seldinger technique. And a big added value for smart midline is the integrated extension line. That means you don't have to manipulate your, your catheter from the uh, close to the puncture sites. That, so that means you have less breathing risk, less infection, and less dislodgement risk. And that's all for the introduction. So thanks again uh, to all for being there today. And I hope you will enjoy this session. Oscar, now the stage is yours. So, Maxim, thank you for that nice introduction. And as the flyer stated, this is called the Weigand Smart Midline Best Practices for Best Outcomes. And I will remove myself from the video so that you can fully concentrate on the slides and the videos here in this slideshow. So, today I will share with you vascular access in our hospital according to our policies, indications, contraindications, and the advantages of the Midland Catheter, the insertion process according to the clinical point of view, and then the clinical tips for making the most of your Midland Catheter. So our hospital is part of the Helsinki University Hospital, some 25 kilometers outside our capital. We have 18 ORs. We do a lot of hip and knee prosthesis, traumatology, urological, day surgery, and vascular access port insertions. We do have some several branches in from the internal medicine wards, and then we do a close collaboration with the infection control team the X-ray department, the infusion clinic, and the outpatient antibiotic treatment team.
Our vascular access team consists of one consultant anesthesiologist, one full-time nurse, and two part-time vascular access nurses. Our doctor plays the ports, the dialysis catheters, and the CVCs, as the nurses concentrate on placing the difficult PIVs, the midline catheters, and the PIC lines. Our team is responsible for training the attending and specialist doctors in ultrasound vascular access device placement. So here you can see our vascular access decision tree on what basis we choose the correct device for the patient. This is based on the INS 2021 guidelines and on the Michigan Appropriateness Guidelines from 2015. Our indications for a midline catheter are short to midterm peripheral IV treatments, difficult IV access patients. Our patients get a lot of contrast injections for CT, MRI or fluoroscopy. We do some recurring blood draws in addition to our treatments as we follow the patient's lab results. Our main vascular access patient profiles are endoprothesis, orthopedic and urologic infections, some sepsis, erysipelas and other soft tissue infections. We do treat a lot of cancer patients which get a whole variety of different treatments and then naturally the outpatient antibiotic treatment team which eventually will take care of all the above patients when they are leaving the hospital and entering home care. The contraindications for a midline catheter are when the patient gets a drug that requires a central vascular access device, when the pH is very low or very high, or when the osmolarity is very high. When the patient is in need of a large volume fluid resuscitation, this is mostly the patients that undergo surgical operations. Or when the IV therapy is estimated to go well past 29 days. The advantages of the midline catheter are you don't need to monitor the patient when you insert the line as this is a peripheral device. The anticoagulation of the patient, low platelet count or high CRP is not an issue normally. It can be used in some sepsis patients from start to finish if the patient gets a relatively short treatment period and the drug is peripherally compatible with the patient. And this prevents venous depletion as you don't have to stick the patient multiple times. And we have a low complication rate and we consider this to be a very cost effective device. So next we will address the insertion process of the midline catheter. We do consider the safety and comfort of the patient comes before everything else. We do a checklist, we check that we have the correct patient, that we have the consent, that the patient's allergies are checked. It's mainly for the local anesthetic lidocaine and the chlorhexidine that we use for disinfection. And then we do a pre-op scan of the arm. We do like to keep the patients warm. We use warm blankets and a bear hugger. So we get nice dilated veins of the arm. And then we raise the patient's bed head and do a slight Trendelenburg position on the bed so that we get more venous pressure on the arm and a nice dilatation. Then we do the pre-op ultrasound. We check for the anatomy, identify the nerves, the veins and arteries and check for any anomalies. We check for the vein diameter that we have a vein that is suitable for the insertion that the catheter takes no more than one third of the veins diameter. Then we scan 
from the anterocubital fossa to the subclavian vein, and we do a compression test. So we see that there is no thrombosis of the vein. And we might do a Doppler scan to evaluate the flow of the blood in the vein. So here we'll do a compression test of the basilic vein and the brachial veins and state that there is no sign of thrombosis of the veins. And here we can see superficial thrombosis of the cephalic vein. You can clearly see that there is a mass inside the vein that the vein does not compress normally that there is edema around the structure of the vein so you should line up the ultrasound device so that you have a clear line from the inserter to the patient's arm to the screen of the ultrasound you target the vein horizontally and vertically in the middle of the screen of the ultrasound device. And then you set gain when the probe cover is applied. You should always adjust your gain. You get too much gain and there will be a light blur. If you have too low gain, you will see a much darker picture. And when the gain is set correctly, you can identify the structures here. So here you can see the basilic vein and then the ulnar nerve. And here is the brachial complex, which consists of the brachial artery and the brachial veins. And then the median nerve here. And here is the median nerve. It identifies itself usually as a cross section of an electrical cable or maybe somewhat like a small pizza, very distinctive. The cephalic vein is very often superficial and quite large in diameter in the anticubital fossa, but rapidly decreases in diameter as it dives into the muscle and should not be a first choice in inserting the midline catheter. And here you can see the disinfection area and you should note that the tourniquet is placed behind the shoulder joint so it will give maximum compression of the axillary vein. And here is the disinfection course of the procedure area. And here you can see our green zone and the ideal place for the puncture site is here in the middle of the circle. The yellow zone is considered to be the zone of movement. When your patient moves the arm, the midline catheter tends to move a lot inside the patient if placed here. And the red area is the area of moisture where the sweat glands are too close. So you should never place your puncture site here unless you intend to tunnel the catheter. You should always do the sterile table in orderly fashion so that you know exactly where your gear is when you need them. Here you can see a picture of the insertion process where the maximum barrier idea is put through. There's a cap, a gown, a face mask and sterile gloves. There's ergonomic positioning of the patient and the ultrasound device. And there is sterility of the site so that you don't have to second guess if you are on a sterile field or not. The needle insertion is often considered as the hardest part in the midline catheter insertion process. We normally do one cc of lidocaine as local anesthesia before the puncture, but if the vein is deeper than two centimeters or the vein is very small in diameter, you should not do this as it pushes the vein somewhat down in the patient's tissues. 
should have the guide wire reel ready to use close at hand before the puncture. And then you should always use the needle in a set, never an arterial or venous cannula, as these tend to be too short and make more damage than the needle in the set. Here you can see the placement of the guide wire reel. So this is the needle insertion with the out of plane technique. Here you advance the needle in turns with the probe until the needle is secured approximately two centimeters into the vein. The intima layer of the vein can be quite yielding, so it's a good idea to do a shallow approach when you're entering the vein, so you won't penetrate the back wall of the vein as you advance with the needle. You should always support your wrists and arms on the patient and on the bed to gain maximum support and stability to your ultrasound and your needle hand. You should never move the needle and the ultrasound probe simultaneously as this will get you confused and you won't be able to see the needle entering in the tissues. You should always have your eyes on the ultrasound screen. Do not look down on the puncture site to the needle for a blood sign because you will most certainly feel the blood start to flow out of the needle when you're entering the vein. It's more important to keep a close look where the needle tip is in the vein. You should always hold firm grip to the needle until the guide wire is inserted into the vein. Here we see the guide wire inserted into the vein in the long axis or the in-plane mode and then you can turn the probe and have a look at the short axis or the out of plane mode to visualize the guide wires position in the vein. Insertion tips number two. When the veins are deep over two centimeters, you should always go gradually from a steeper angle like 60 degrees to 45 to 25 degrees when inserting the needle into the vein. This will allow the wire to be inserted in a more shallower angle and you will probably have a more easier time inserting the dilatator and the catheter into the vein. You should tighten the skin distally to, to the puncture side when inserting the dilatator and the catheter over the wire as this will make the angle more shallow. You should always be sure that the wire is fed out through the catheter orifice and grab before the catheter is inserted through the skin so that you won't lose the wire inside the patient. If you have difficulty aspirating the catheter when it's entered, you should always flush with a couple of cc's of saline to make sure that the catheter is released if it's stuck to a venous flap or the catheter is leaning towards the vein wall. Using cyanoacrylate glue is highly recommended when inserting a venous catheter that is not made of silicone. It reduces the movement of the catheter in the puncture site. It seals the puncture site so the microbes will be having a harder time getting in. It's antimicrobial and it prevents bleeding, so you will have a prolonged dressing change from the normal 24 hours to up to a week. So now you have inserted the catheter and glued it, and it's time to put a dressing on. You should always secure the catheter first onto the fastening device, then fasten the device to the skin. You should fasten it always with a chlorhexidine gluconat semi-permeable dressing. And if the patient is allergic to chlorhexidine, you should use a plain sterile dressing. We like to use the grip lock and the tegaderm chlorhexidine dressings in our patients. We like to use the anti-reflux needless connectors with the midline 
because there is minimal reflux. There are double valves that prevent backflow even if the drip wagon runs dry or the venous pressure is elevated for some other reason. ANTT is a lot easier to apply on the needleless connector than it would be to clean the catheter orifice every time you use it. Here is the neutron device and this is the Bionector TKO. All needle-free connectors are not equal. As there are many different kind of connectors on the market, you should always pick the one that is the most cost efficient. This being said, is not always the cheapest that is the best. You should always use a disinfecting cap on the needleless connector if the patient is getting intermittent treatments. It protects the needleless connector and the catheter from contamination. It's fast to use. You apply it for one minute and it's ready to use. It's threaded so it will make a tight fit and the patient won't be able to take it off. It's single use. You remove it and you discard it. And as my steam colleagues have pointed out, there is poor compliance and disinfection techniques when scrubbing the hub, as stated by the persons below. So you have finished the insertion process of the catheter and you are quite contented with yourself. Everything looking good or what? Well, not exactly. Here are some typical rookie mistakes being made. There is blood in the threads of the needleless connector. The date is missing, so you have no clue when the dressing has been changed. The ID tag of the catheter has been falsely placed on the dressing, so the next dressing change you will lose the ID tag. This should be put on the catheter. And there is poor visibility into the puncture site of the midline catheter as the dressing is too close to the puncture site. Et voila! Here you have a cap on the good quality needleless connector. The catheter ID tag is correctly placed onto the catheter. The dressing change date has been applied, so you know when you do for your next dressing change. And the catheter is left out an extra centimeter so you can monitor the VIP score here. So, then for flushing and locking the midline catheter, you should always power flush the line with 10 cc of saline after aspiration between drugs and infusets and after concluded therapy. Always use the pulsating start stop technique when flushing the line and a saline lock is often enough. You double the flush volume after drawing blood, giving blood products or giving a contrast agents to the patient. When using the line for intermittent use, the line should be flushed every 12 hours. Our OPAT prefers 24 hour elastomeric pumps. You should do a 20 cc power flush when changing the pump every 24 hours. Always use pre-fill syringes when flushing. And you can use 4% sodium citrate with or without taurolidine as a lock for patients with tendency for bloodstream infections or habitual line clogging. This is usual frequent flyer patients that you get to know. and the maintenance of the catheter and the dressings. You should always change the dressing every seven days unless the dressing is wet, soiled, bloodstained, loose, or detached in any way. You should remove the old dressing per ANTT. You should disinfect hands and change gloves. And then you clean the site with 2% chlorhexidine gluconate or 80% alcohol should disinfect your hands and change to sterile gloves and apply the new dressing using sterile or surgical ANTT. This means face mask gloves sterile technique. 
and you should change the needless connector if it hasn't been changed recently. You should always pull the dressing away from you when you're removing the old dressing to prevent dislodging the catheter. You should always use ANTT for disinfection and you should always let the chlorhexidine disinfectant dry for at least three minutes before you apply the new dressing to prevent dermatitis and other skin reactions. You should always use sterile ANTT when apply new dressings and you should always put on the date on the dressing when you have changed it and should not cover the dressing with a tape or anything else. And as we stated before, we do use the Smart Midland for power injection too. Here is an example of a CT scan that we use 3 milliliters per second. And as you see, the pressure rate is nowhere near the 300 PSI red line. And we use it for MRI and fluoroscopy too. We do some fluid resuscitation with Smart Midline and using a pressure bag, you can extract five milliliters per second flow from the midline catheter. Blood sampling should always use a three-way stopcock, a 10 cc syringe for the blood that you are about to discard and a vacutainer device in the other port or another 10 cc syringe to obtain the sample. Should never attach the vacutainer directly to the midline because if the vacutainer device breaks, you will probably have to insert another line. You don't have to use a tourniquet for this procedure. You should always discard three cc's of blood before sampling it. And you should always remember to flush the catheter immediately after sampling so the line won't get clogged. Here you see the vacutainer and the 10 cc syringe attached to the midline via the three-way stopcock. Here you take the blood that is about to discard, and here you take the sample into the test tube. And what about adverse events? Sure there are. I picked some from the latest studies concerning midline catheters, and this is what I found out. Line clogging stands for about 4.8%, thrombosis per superficial venous thrombosis 4.6%, and DVT 2.8%. Leakage is around 3.8%, accidental removal is 3.7%, phlebitis is one and a half percent and bacteremia is around 0.6 percent and this is only one study. Line clogging is often a sign of inadequate flushing of the catheter. Not just how often you flush it but the manner that you are using to flush the catheter. You should always use power injection or push and pause method. Superficial venous thrombosis often suggests that the use of cephalic vein should not be your first choice. You should use the basilic or the brachial veins. As for deep vein thrombosis, the catheter should always be placed in the middle upper arm to minimize line movement. Catheter diameter should never exceed 45% of the vein's diameter. Leakage from the catheter entry site is a strong sign of blocking thrombosis present in front of the midline catheter's tip. You should always check this with an ultrasound if it's a problem either with the catheter or the venous thrombosis. Accidental removal is often a result of catheter or IV line snagging somewhere or simply the patient pulling the line. You should always use the cyanoacrylate glue and a good fastening dressing. 
if the patient is prone to pulling the line, you could always use a long sleeve shirt and try to minimize the risk in that manner. Phlebitis is often caused by catheter movement at the puncture site, and here is the same as the above. Should always have a good quality fastening device and use the glue. Catheter associated bloodstream infection is rare but potentially dangerous. Should always run diagnostics which microbe it is, how aggressive it is, what kind of status the patient is in should do paired blood cultures to determine if it's a line infection or if the infection source is somewhere else. And then you have two options. You either keep the catheter and try to save it or remove it and replace, which is more common, at least in Finland. Should wonder about contamination of the samples if they are inconsistent with the bacteria found in the patient. And as stated before, the catheter is not always the source of infection, but as this is a peripheral device, it is easy to remove and replace rather than try to salvage the catheter and risk the BSI getting worse in the patient. So here we see a healthy axillary vein with a midline catheter. You can see the catheter moving freely in the vein. The vein is compressible and there is no sign of edema or irritation around the vein. And also in the front of the catheter, the vein is compressible and shows no sign of thrombosis. And here we have an axillary vein, deep vein thrombosis with a midline catheter. You can clearly see that there is irritation and edema around the vein and a clear mass around the catheter and vein walls in this axillary vein. And as we move past the midline catheter tip, you can always also see that there is signs of vein thrombosis. You should protect your patients at all times from unnecessary infection to infiltration or extravasation or more extravasation of unclean PIVs or misplaced PIVs or central lines that not taken care of properly and patient being stick too often. And you should not use peripheral IV lines endlessly because you have a good option. You should get proper training before you start to place any vascular access devices on patients. And then when you have become the master of art, the training does not stop there. The vascular access art is a continuous learning cycle. And you should get proper gear and get a midline instead of this ridiculous kind of device placements. So thank you so much for your attention and I think it's time for some Q&A with Maxime. Over to you. Thank you for sharing tips and tricks. Uh, Oscar, can you start your video maybe for the Q&A? And we have some questions. Ah, here we are. Your mic is off for now. Uh, we cannot hear you for now, Oscar. We cannot hear you well. Uh, your mic is off. Oh, okay. 
Perfect. Yeah. Okie dokie. Much better this way. Yeah. <laughs> sure. <laughs> sure. Uh, uh, so, yeah. yeah. Thank, thank you. Yeah, thanks, thank, thanks again. Uh, so we have some questions already in the chat. Um, we have uh, this one. Uh, wait and see. Yeah, Nina Mimi. Yeah. Okay. We'll do it this in English, even apparently or Finnish. So yeah, we do, we we do always uh, put the dressing on the glue because. Um, if you leave it just to the glue, you will probably the clothes will rub off some of the glue and it will make a pathway to microbes. So yes, we put put and dressing on every time we use the glue. So it's kind mm -hmm. of I know it's a kind of feels like double on double, but it actually protects the patients quite good. So yeah, we do it. Okay, you you mean you, you put the glue on the on the puncture site so it, it avoid bleeding and also um, yeah. it reduce the germ going inside the wound. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then you wait it for dry for how yeah. long? Yeah, yeah, wait a couple of minutes. It's the long long period of three minutes, but it's <laughs> it's it's well worth. We know all about anesthesia and the surgeon parts. We are uh. inpatient, but we wait for at least two or three minutes for okay. the glue to set and then you put the dressing on and we actually just we glue the puncture site not the whole catheter so okay yeah. okay great we have another questions uh, here uh, from ruben assuming one does not have the bygone dressing would you recommend glue over suture how soon can the line be removed after glue means for a long period well, quite tricky question yeah, it's kind of, we actually, yeah, we don't actually use sutures, but I know if if uh, you refer to suturing the lion and then using glue, yes, you can use glue over sutures and it will seal them quite well, but there is always the risk of infection when you're using sutures, so that's why we use the Mm, okay. We use the sutureless device, yeah. Okay. And um, how how sorry. how fast? Yeah, how fast you can remove it? That you can actually remove remove it immediately. But the as you know, the skin isn't matured under under there for at least a couple of three or four days. So that mm. will set some limits. Okay. Uh, another question: Why do we use only peripheral syringe when flushing? Yeah, it's just for, it's first mainly for, it's for aseptic reasons. You have a sterile syringe. You don't have to pull. You never know when, you, if there's a bottle on the table with 100 and 250 mils of saline, you never use, I know actually if it's clean or not, if it has been contaminated unless you're the sole person to use it. So I would strongly suggest that you use pre-filled mm -hmm. syringes when you flush the line. It's it's a matter of convenience too. And then there is a different kind of, we use the 10 milliliter syringe when we flush mm -hmm. the midline, CVs or picks. And then they're actual, the, the pressure is the pressure is the same even if it's a five milliliter or three milliliter syringe as the diameter of the of the syringe is the same so you won't get any surplus pressure from it so yeah okay yeah. and also if you want to avoid some mistakes some uh, i know as a nurse as well as some people can uh, can um, take um, fluid from a you know a small small volume of uh, of another fluid and uh, and they think it's it's normal saline, but finally it's not. Yes, here here there have been some horrible mistakes when mm. when you take something and you depend on the vial color or something else you don't read properly. And there has been a couple of cases I know, mm. not in Finland but elsewhere that you take raw potassium and okay. shove it yeah, into the patient exactly. that it's fatal. Yeah, so yeah. that's why the syringes are. I think good. Yeah, the best way. I strongly, yeah, strongly yeah. recommend it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we have another question. If you aspirate blood from the catheter, do you always change the needles, needleless connectors? 
So if the catheter is used three times a day and the blood needs to be aspirated with time before use, you should also change the needle collector three times a day. Yeah, if you if you draw blood, it depends on the connector. Some some connectors are su more more suitable if they don't have the double valve system. It's it's more easier to keep them clean with the flushing, but with the double valve system, it's it's kind of a tricky question because you should remove you should remove the uh, the connector when you take blood samples. But on the other hand, if you remove it three times a day, it's quite costly, and then there is the possibility of infection. So yeah, I would I would keep the connector if you draw blood three times a day. But if it's it's a couple of times per week, then we would change the connector. But this frequent blood draws, I would keep the connector. Okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, another question from Ruben. Is intention at the intermediate antiquity fossa is non non zone <laughs> for the this is, this is this is the part where it's easy. Yes. <laughs> it's absolutely no no. <laughs> not not in the anticubital fossa and and definitely not with the ultrasound because we had a, have a couple of cases where it's put in the anticubital fossa and they every patient gets thrombosis there are three okay. of these cases in the okay. near future so no no okay and uh, so from your side uh, oscar we talked about this uh, before uh, you always insert the your smarting line on the upper arm i mean above the anticubital fossa is that correct yeah yeah always okay. always in the you sometimes have to compromise if it's not always in the middle you can always go a little bit down or a bit up but absolutely not in the okay in, in the be... place of where the line tends to move around a lot mm. and, and you know in uh, so to answer another question maybe uh, in some place they they use the the smart mid line and they use the small lens uh to insert the this this line on the forearm i mean you should anyway avoid the wrist and you enter and take fossa yeah. anyway yeah yeah if, if you have i'm sorry if you have a uh, if you have a large vein enough in the forearm and a short catheter it's totally fine hmm. yeah or the, think about your vein ratio yeah vein naturally ratio. yeah okay uh, another question from Ronnie. Lots of customers ask about vancomycin and vasopressor. Is there a lot of material? What is the official answer for that? Uh, ah, so the, <laughs> this is the, the, yeah. The next question. No, this is this is this is actually quite tricky. But uh, yeah. short time vanco and vasopressors is fine, but not long term. Mm. And we are talking about a couple of days, max a week. Exactly. absolutely maximum week and then you, there's the concentration how much how much uh, saline you dilute it in it's minimum 250 mils so mm, yeah exactly and it's the and, same and then you have, yeah yeah this is this is tricky as the mm. as the there is the ph and then there's the irritability and of the risk of extravasation and stuff like mm. that. So I would go for a couple of days, but not not long term, no, not weeks. Then it's a peak line or exactly. Else. Anyway, yeah. even you know, in my daily practice in ER, we use a short peripheral cannula to in, to inject vasopressor or vancomycin. But as Oscar say, it's a really a short duration. If you need a long uh, vasopressor therapy. That limitation will be maybe in the ICU or in a in a in a intensive care ward, and it will need a central line for that. Yeah, yeah. This is this we use sometimes in what we call a, a transient line. So when mm -hmm. the patient is getting the treatment and, and the CRP is very high, or the patient is septic, then we give the vanco through the midline until mm -hmm. the patient is stable enough to receive a peak line that's the usually the, the exactly. case yeah uh another question but it's finally it's the same i know this is a very contentious about our person <laughs> okay mm. i think we we already answered that yeah yeah um well how about children asks linda do you use some local anesthesia or sedation 
Uh, rare case. Of we we are lucky in that way that we don't you we don't put lines in children. Thank God. <laughs> but, <laughs> but but actually, I, I've done some on, on small children. You you have the parent with them, and then you absolutely give minimum local anesthesia and we usually give some sedation and then we have the anesthesiologist there mm. on site but it's still in the recovery so we can we can give give some propofol or gas if we are in the OR but this is this is so rare that I think I've done five in the last seven years so it's okay. not that common yeah you're really uh, expert but uh, maybe not much more on uh, on, on on pediatric yeah, no, not not in the pediatric mm. pediatric scene. In Finland, mm. it's very common for doctors that they mm. take care of the vascular access in children. So oh, okay. there, there is very strict rules about that. Here. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, about your vascular access team, ask Linda again. How big is the hospital? How many beds? How many catheter insertion per day, etc. Um, that's a good question. Some three hundred beds, plus minus minus mm -hmm. fifty. Uh, catheter insertions maybe 150 midlines, some 300 plus big lines, CVs a couple of hundreds and 50 or okay. 60 dialysis catheters and some mm -hmm. hundred ports. Yeah. Okay. And, and what the education? What the ah, <laughs> yeah. This is, you are the master of the education. Yeah. This is this is this is some something that yeah, the vascular access nurses that I have taught here in Finland are some 22 now that we have kind of a special tailor-made education mm -hmm. that they first they receive some material that they get to know on their own time and then we do theory sessions for one or two days depending on anesthesia nurses usually get, tend to get the one day course and then there is some practical training on the dummy or the phantom and then we actually place on patients and then they are sent to their own units to place the catheters and then we have a test for them practical mm -hmm. test where they have to perform on their own and we evaluate if they get the license or not so that's kind of okay. roughly yeah. okay good to make a good uh, insertion nurse yeah, we, we we are we are quite tight on the subject. So <laughs> I've heard a couple of times that you could be go a lot easier on the your okay. colleagues, but I don't think I will. <laughs> uh, another question: What is your recommendation when ultrasound guidance is not available? Ah, uh -huh, that's a great question by Monsef. Yeah, that um, that is that that's a tricky question because we are so lucky that we have the ultrasound mm -hmm. guidance and we use it always as it is per the INS to mm. is recommended yeah. when you enter the, the That's middle my, of the uh, upper arm. Yeah. yeah, you could you could do small catheters and short ones in the mm. in the upper upper arm if the veins are quite superficial that mm. if the patient is lean enough so to say or then in the forearm yeah you that's should, correct. you, you can and use if, short ones yeah and, and if i may if you don't have to sound uh, in your in your world maybe you can uh, as you said oscar you, you should see or uh, you the vein should be be able to be palpate and uh, that mean maybe the four the forearm uh, placement can be an option for that because it's that, easier to see your vein in the forearm definitely yeah. hmm. um what is the nursing care offline in it's a really great good question because it's mandatory the care of your line and the maintenance is really mandatory to keep your line open to keep the patency of your of uh, your catheters yeah yeah we usually recommend the flushing something between eight or 12, 12 hours depends on what kind of if you run nutrition it's more like six hours you should flush in between mm. to keep the line open and if you draw a lot of blood then you should always flush yeah. it more it, as i said it's just not the regime and uh, by the hour of the flushing it's more like the technique you should people tend to be to go too easy on the line you should use 
the power flush uh, mm -hmm. actually that you should yeah push pause push push pause, push, pause, pause and, uh, and use use a really not a mm -hmm. soft hand but, but <laughs> determined one so to say <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah that, and, is, uh, that is the most uh, that, that, that that's uh, yeah i'm sorry that's actually what kills the line is, is the inadequate flushing volume and the inadequate flushing technique that that kills the line uh, yeah and uh, and uh, yeah yeah and it's, it's really really mandatory and so in your daily practice you used to say at least eight, every eight or twelve hour right? at, yeah at least a, at least uh, once a day yeah anyway. uh, yeah once or twice a day and mm -hmm. we are we are yielding to the antibiotic team as they use the twenty four hour pumps but mm -hmm. then we double the flushing volume should be at least twenty cc's and giving mm -hmm. in a rigorous okay. push yeah um so we have a few minutes left uh, uh last question Stanislav uh asking in context of blogger anesthesia may be useful to apply uh yeah that mean they they can apply cream do, do you already heard about this cream yeah you, you could use the emla the brilocaine lidocaine cream but you should have it at least first you mm. should check for check with ultrasound and mark the area and then exactly. you should Apply they, the cream they should apply it for at least wait. three hours because yeah it, to be effective but mm. i i i actually like to use the lidocaine subcutaneously yeah. so yeah, with, yeah, a, so with a needle it's, it's much more effective this is this this is quite hard yeah, yeah, and yeah, if, yeah. You, if you have to change the puncture site then then you then yeah, you have to wait you, extra you, three hours so. you have to go deep really deep it, it's not a, uh, just a shooter is uh, you have to go deeper that means the topical cream will be effective we used to say around uh, four, you have to wait at least 45 minutes to one hour and uh it's really it's gonna be the anesthesia would be really superficial and not uh, not deep enough i i'm scared about the about the patient's pain yeah yeah if you want to use it effectively you should apply apply lots of it and two or three mm. hours at least yeah yeah exactly That's my, yeah um sergi asks us can we insert midline to french in the forearm and if we don't have trust on the yes i would yep. say yes because uh, we have many insertions so maybe not in your in your unit uh oscar but uh, i know that in uh, in uh, uk for example they insert a lot of uh, two or three french midline in the forearm without interest and guidance but you have to be skilled with this. Yeah. Um, so I think we have almost done. Let me check. Um, I think, yeah, we have done everything. Uh, one last question. Thank you very much for being cheeky. If you're going to have any victory to support the short term use of Russell Press or Midline. Yeah, I will. I will keep this. Uh, I will take care of this, uh, Ruben. Yeah. Okay, I think uh, we have done. Yes. Um, uh, whether it will be possible to listen again? Yes, sure. At the end of the session, as I said at the beginning, you will receive in your email the certificate of attendance and also the link to access this replay. So, no worries, you will be able to listen and to see her face again. And um, thank you very much, Oscar. Uh, it you. was really helpful. And thank you for sharing your tips and tricks from the expert. It was a smart big line overview. Thank you very much again. And um, have a great day, everyone. Thank you, Oscar. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye.